Hi, hi. Welcome to week four in Journey to Healing class. Um, I am Carol Romeo, and my beloved is running around trying to get everything done. <laughs> but um, today I'm actually going to teach on rejection. Um, now that we are public, I have to change my teaching for this lesson, so we'll see how I do. Um, today will be... Um, Gotcha, ladies. Thank you. Today we'll be um, teaching, and we incorporate our testimonies anyways. Um, no groups today. Normally we do have them, but we apologize. Uh, we have to be somewhere right after this. So that's okay. Next week we will um, have full group time. Normally this week for our groups, all we do anyways is just exchanging numbers, which we just did. Um, and um, we process previous people that were here, the previous class, uh, but nobody from the previous class is going to be here today for processing. However, they will be back next week for processing, so y'all will get to be able to witness what we do in group time. So we're just going to push it off another week. Um, this is why we are a spirit-led ministry, because uh, we can make our plans, as the Lord says in the Bible. and. Uh, but the Lord's will prevail. So Lord's timing and God's ways are always gonna are always gonna go, no matter what we do, no matter how much we plan, and no matter how much we pray and seek Him, um, His will will be done. Amen. All right. So let's get into it. Without further ado, Chapter Four. If you have a new book, um, it'll be page thirty-five in the in the new books uh, for people that have taken the class before. I don't know what page it is. It should be around 30. It <laughs> should be in the 30s. 37. 37. Okay. So um, so 35 is rejection. Who here read the lesson? Good job, good job, good job. Okay. This is number one. Uno, you have to read the lessons every week. If you don't read these lessons every week, you will fall behind and be lost. You cannot catch up quickly. This is not teaching material that like you can just quickly like oh yeah i need my verse of the day this is like serious meat to chew on this is not like oh yeah i gotta I take a real quick sip of something spiritual okay no this is like serious meat this is like steak and we're not even talking like ribeye steaks with lots of fat okay where like you know it's easy to chew Right, we're talking like the kind that like you're chewing on and, and it's like taking forever to break down in your mouth and you're like, oh my God, when is this finally going to be like, you know, like that kind of chewing steak? Yeah, that's the kind, that, that, that's the kind of meat that we have in these lessons. Um, so, um, all right, who, uh, who did their DMI this week? Show of hands, good job. Yay, yay, yay. So, um, and uh, who uh, this week in doing their DMI, uh, who this week um, heard something new that you've never heard before from the Lord? Just raise your hand if you heard something new, okay? And, um, and did the Lord reveal to you some negative, raise your hand, if the Lord revealed to you some, on the left-hand column, some negative attitudes or some negative things that that you're struggling with okay good all right excellent so next week when we do groups we're actually going to discuss your rejection lists so the homework for this week anthony's smiling because he knows the homework for this week is is like we taught last week is journaling and dmi okay that's your first tool then this week we we go up a step level, okay, uh, up up another level, and we and we go up to this step, and this step is is writing your rejection lists, okay. So you're gonna write this week um, what um, who's rejected you, who do you feel has rejected you? Now some rejections you're gonna know right off the bat. Some, you know, divorces, breakups, abandonment, if your parents got divorced, um, if, uh, if your dad left you or your mom left you, or if they went to jail, if they died, these are all rejections. These are like kind of, if you will, known rejections, all right? Um, if you were raped, sexually molested, 
obvious rejection wound, okay? Uh, if you had, were in a domestic violence relationship where you either were punching them or that person was punching you, obvious rejections, okay? You were either rejecting that person, which you need to write that down, or they were punching you, which you were the rejection receiver, okay? So those are like what I call the obvious rejection wounds, all right? And we still want you to write those down. So you're gonna write down names of the person. So you're gonna write down your rejection list, just like on a sheet of paper in your journal, and you're just gonna write the names of the people, mom, dad, whatever, okay? Brothers, sisters, anybody who's ever hurt you. And that hurt can be verbal, they could say something to you that like just really struck a chord and, and hurt, you know, and, and it could be a pastor. I've had pastor wounds where I've had pastors come up to me and, and verbally abuse me and emotionally abuse me and say things that were completely, you know, abusive, flat out abusive. Um, and so I had to forgive them, you know. So, so it could be any type of hurt, all right any type of hurt, mental, emotional, financial, spiritual, physical, and sexual. There's six different types of hurts, okay? So those, that's gonna be your first list this week that you're gonna start working on is the lists of all those people's names. So that's number one, okay? Number two, after you write up that list, then you're gonna journal. And then you're gonna journal and you're gonna ask the Lord out of that list of names of rejections, you're gonna ask the Lord, who is the first person that I need to face? What is the first rejection, like the, like the biggest one, Lord, that I need to face? So it could be somebody present in your life, like in a current relationship, like if you're married and, you know, it could be that, you know, if it's like, like, a, like a present situation like that you're in, like struggling in, it could be that. Sometimes we can't go back until we can face what we're facing like in front of us, you know. Um, sometimes, sometimes God will reveal somebody easy, you know, like I call it easy, uh, but you know, someone that's like, um, like, like somebody that is, is from church hurt, we'll say, you know, like someone who, who hurt you at church and it's preventing you from serving or preventing you from committing or preventing you from even coming to church. You know, it might be something simple, if you will, okay, not something deep wounded, yeah. So it might be something that's deep and maybe you were molested and maybe you need to, God wants you to face that big rejection wound, okay? Whoever that that person is, is who, that's why we do the journaling first, so that you learn how to journal and seek the Lord and his guidance and direction for your life. So I want you to, this week, to, um, to ask the Lord who you want to, well, who the Lord wants you to um, focus on first, okay, for rejection, all right? Then, as you read the chapter, there's later on in the chapter, we teach you how to write out their name at the top, and then you're gonna write down, it hurt me when, and then all the things they did to hurt you. Whatever they said, whatever they did to you that hurt you. We want you writing that out, okay? All right, I'm gonna get to that in just a minute, but I wanted to give you a heads up of the homework for this week, because it is this is one of our biggest weeks this week and next week for resentments are our two biggest like taking lists week, okay? And without these lists for this week and next week, we cannot move you on, okay? So if you don't do the homework and read the chapters for this week and for next week, the following weeks you're gonna be lost. I mean, completely lost, okay? So this is, this is crucial time for this class. All right, rejection. Before we can get to rejection, we have to face, if anybody read their chapter, what do we face first? Broken bridges, yes, we have to face broken bridges. Broken bridges, if you didn't read your chapter, are bridges, trust bridges, it's basically a trust bridge. These bridges are created in us by God, okay, that um, are, 
natural for us to be able to trust our creator, right, our heavenly father, and also to trust our mother from the womb that we came out of, okay, and our um, earthly father, okay. Uh, these are natural things that God created in us, these these bridges, trust bridges, okay, it's for nurturing and filling us up, okay, so we can be filled up with love and trust and joy and peace and all these things that God desires for us to be raised and trained up in, right? Not in the dysfunction we were raised and trained up in, okay? So bridges that are broken are broken by the people. That's why we say zero to six, the people that we were raised in the household with, okay? So um, those bridges started breaking off by rejection wounds in a nutshell, okay? So um, types of breaks that, um, that start breaking our bridges are first and foremost in the womb. So we call it a womb wound, okay? So when, when you were in your mother, your birth mother, if she thought about abortion, if she was contemplating abortion, struggling with it, that created a broken bridge in you with your birth mother, okay? If your mother gave you up for adoption, okay? The bridge wasn't broken with the birth mother because even though she was giving you away, you still felt rejection because you were given away. It's, it's a different type of rejection wound than abortion because abortion is wanting to get rid of it or them, want to get rid of them, murder, killing, right? And, and so that's a totally deeper wound than being given up to a family who loves them, okay? So even though it's still rejection and we still have to face those rejection wounds, um, and walk through it, you still are like in a better mindset and a better place because you know that it was done out of love. You know that your birth mother at least loved you enough to give you to somebody that, you know, could take care of you or wanted to take care of you, okay? Um, so we have to first look at, um, and that's where the journaling tool comes in, really important is asking the Lord, you know, about your womb wound. So number one, Lord, what are my womb wounds? Okay, so this is gonna be a journaling question this week that we want you to take to the Lord and you're just gonna write down whatever you hear. Don't question it, don't doubt it, just write whatever you hear. Okay, if you're not sure about it, text your leaders. We will guide you and lead you, okay? Um, so that's the first journal question uh, for this week. Um, if you don't hear anything, it's okay. It means you're not ready to listen to it. You're not ready to face it and hear it, and that's okay. You can come back to it another time, okay? Um, all right, so that's number one, prenatal. So prenatal wounds are the number one breaks and first broken bridges in our life, okay, prenatal. Number two, abuse, the obvious one that I was talking about. Anytime, this is also, broken bridges are also, if you witnessed domestic violence. So if you were in a home, and even though you weren't physically being abused, but your mother was in an abusive relationship with your father, or maybe it was a step-parent situation, either way, if there was abuse in the home, it causes broken bridges of trust with you and, you and those adults and authority figures, male, female, et cetera. So that you as a child see that dysfunction and think that that is normal. So therefore then you have that dysfunction in your mind believing that lie that that is normal and therefore attract abuse to your life. And you are attracted to that chaos in your life, okay? Which you'll learn later why. All right? So, 
even if it wasn't to you, but it was done around you, write those names down. If it was, even if it wasn't your parents or step parents, and maybe it was a brother or sister, maybe it was somebody that lived with you temporarily, like, a, like if you were in foster, if you had foster kids, and maybe the foster kid abused you, or maybe they abused your sister or brother and you witnessed it, write their names down. You need to walk through that. Any type of abuse that was around you broke all trust bridges in you with family, with all kinds of people in your life. Okay, number three, addictions. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. Okay, um, it was like the big elephant in the room. Nobody talked about it. Just everybody knew it, you know. Um, so when I used to think, when I was in drug rehab, my parents, I was in drug rehab. I was in a like lockdown facility when I was 16. And um, I remember we were in family counseling and the therapist was like blaming my dad. And the therapist is like, well, it's your fault. You're, you're the alcoholic and, and you're the one with the dysfunction and, and, and it's your fault that your daughter's a drug addict and, and running to the streets, you know, and um, blah, blah. So, and I defended my dad and I stood up and I was so angry and I was like, don't you blame my father, it's not his fault. And then the, the therapist looks at my mother and goes, do you see what I mean? And then he goes, okay, Carol, you can go back to your room. And then that family session was over. And then he continued with them. I was 16 years old defending my father for his dis dysfunction and his addiction. Yeah, and blame your mother. And that's what happens to us because of the lies that we believe from the dysfunction of addiction in our home. You know, and, and so um, my trust bridges with um, <laughs> really everybody were already broken by 16. You know, they were broken before that. But um, so addiction is, is another way to break a trust bridge. Of course, if you're a spouse or in your relationship, that, that's obvious. You know, if your husband's addicted to porn and is watching porn instead of, showing you love and affection, you feel rejection, don't you ladies? Absolutely. We feel absolutely rejected when our men are turned into something fake when they got the real thing in the bedroom. It's a huge rejection wound, ladies, that you'll need to face. And vice versa for men. Okay, it doesn't just happen to one side of the fence. So, you know, porn, um, any type of addiction that it could be, going to the gym, going to the gym. If, if, you're, if you're a gym rat, and, and instead of loving your wife or loving your husband, and you gotta, you gotta um, focus on yourself, and make you focus on yourself, and you're so self-focused that you're rejecting your marriage and your children at home, your family, that's rejection, okay? It could be even something that's, quote, healthy that we're doing, but we're still causing rejection to the people in our homes, okay? The people in our lives, all right? Um, number four, affairs, okay? So obvious is sexual affairs cause rejection wounds, duh. But the reason why we point this out is that it's not just the people that have cheated on you or that you have cheated on, it's the affairs that happen parentally in your life. So if you were um, at home and your parents were fighting because you know he's out late with his secretary and she knows she caught them cheating and, and you see all that chaos, okay? Those are, those are all broken bridges. They're all creating broken bridges in your life, okay? Um, emotional affairs create broken bridges as well, not just sexual affairs. Um, a pastor, once that I, that I know I, I love dearly, said to me, Carol, um, this was years ago, he said to me, um, after counseling me, after a, a, I was in the middle of a divorce because of multiple affairs, and he said, Carol, men don't have 
um, emotional affairs, just to let you know. Men have sexual affairs. Women have emotional affairs. Men use emotional affairs to get sex. So he said, so, so you're, he may be confessing to the sin of emotional affairs, but, and not confessing to the sexual affairs, but I can guarantee you that he's having sex with those women that he's in an emotional affairs with. Um, he's like, that's how, men, that's how men work. That's how they are. So, um, so we say the same thing, that emotional affairs, when, when you know that your man is turning to another woman, even if it's not for sex, that's causing a broken bridge of trust in the relationship. Okay? Same, and it goes the opposite way. If you know your woman is turning to another man to lean on his shoulder, to go to him for stuff, and not to come to you, that's causing a broken bridge. Okay? And abandonment is the last one. Um, this is not just abandonment from, you know, dads or moms leaving the home, um, but this is abandonment or parental abandonment. This is also abandonment of friends. Friends. They call it ghosting now. Ghosting now, yeah. People that just up and stop communicating with you and just don't return your phone calls and block you and delete you off social media for no reason and you're left to think, what the heck did I do? You know, that's, that's abandonment, you know? Write their name down on the list, okay? Whoever ghosted you. So it's, um, it's pastoral, pastors who abandon you that you turn to and they... Stop, they don't return your phone calls. They stop talking to you. They just, you know, stop speaking to you. It's ghosting you spiritually, okay? So those are, these are to help stir you up to think of people you need to write down on your lists, okay? All right. Um, in reaction to these broken bridges, we become defensive. Okay? So we become defensive, and these defense mechanisms are what cause us to self-protect. This is when we start believing lies from the enemy, is in this process. As soon as that, that bridge of trust is broken with that particular person or people, that's right when the enemy comes in, speaks his lie into your life. Oh, you're unworthy. You're unwanted. You're good, no piece of whatever. You're whatever, okay? All those lies, you're stupid, you're a failure, you're not good enough, you're damaged goods, okay? These are all lies from the pit of hell, all right? Lies from the enemy. He's the father of lies, the Bible says, okay? And we believe those lies in that moment as children, because we're children, number one, and number two, because we are so broken already in an area that we were never even created or meant to be broken in, which is in relationships with those who just delivered us, who raised us, and who, right, our parents and our family who are supposed to be loving us, okay? This is when codependency comes in. This is the root of codependency because you either go two ways at this moment. You believe the lie from the enemy, so you say, well, I don't need them. I'm just going to do it myself. I don't need my parents. I don't need my siblings. I don't need men, or I don't need a woman in my life. I'm just going to do it all myself. That's codependency. That's not what God has designed us to be like. Okay, that's when the... The, the lie that you can have any control over your life and over the lives of others came in. That's a lie from the, that, from the enemy on another level. Lie. Okay? So we think also in this time period of that broken bridge is, well, I can fix them by pleasing them. Another lie of codependency. 
Well, I can fix my parents if, 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 I, could just, if I could just be good enough and, be a, and just be perfect and be a straight A student and, and, and blah, 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 then, then dad won't drink anymore and, and they'll stop fighting and, and, and then life will be great. That's, what we, that's how we think as children, okay? So that fix it mentality of codependency, that's when that comes in, is, is when the bridge is broken in that moment in that relationship, okay? Which we know that doesn't work now that we're adults, right? And we've tried that and it didn't work. So uh, broken bridges for me. Uh, my womb wound was, um, did I say this already in class? No. Okay. Um, so, uh, my womb wound was when I took it to the Lord, um, was, uh, my first one was, um, my, I was unwanted. Unwanted because I was, um, conceived under wedlock, outside of wet, wedlock. Okay, I was born in 70s. So, um, and my grandma, my mom's mom, had rejected her. Um, so, granny, grandma had rejected mom, my mom. You know, and I was in the womb, and I heard grandma and her fighting. You know, I, it's not all the time, but, you know, it was like a reoccurring fight. All right, and, and arguing because... Um, you know, what are people going to say? What are people going to think? You're not even married. You know, right? So I felt rejected in the womb because, because my mom felt rejected. So rejection wounds can go that deep. The mother who's carrying the baby when she's feeling rejected or if she's in an abusive relationship when she's pregnant at that time or doing drugs or anything like that, that baby inside is feeling all that rejection. Okay? And then out of rejection, we become what? Defensive. We build our defense mechanisms. We become one of our defense mechanisms. Number one is codependency. Trying to please others. Make people happy. Okay? To try to fix it and fix them and fix my life then and then hopefully I'll feel better. Okay, so that was my first womb wound, and then my first um, rejection wound was with um, was with my my dad when I was two, and drinking, and I was a little girl, and I came home and was like, oh, um, you know, he came home from work. He was a steel mill worker, and he always went to the bar for about an hour after coming off getting off work, and he come home, and uh, I was like, oh, daddy, daddy, and I ran up to him and. And he just turned around, he just, whatever, was drunk or something, I don't know, didn't hear me, and then turned around and took a shot and a beer, and I was standing, like, right here, and I was just waiting for him to finish his drinking so that he would come love on me and pick me up and show me attention. So that was my first rejection wound from my father. Okay, because I perceived him rejecting me because he turned his back to me for his addiction. Remember, addiction is a broken bridge, causes broken bridges. Okay, so he had to feed himself in his addiction, and to be in his addiction, he then had to what? Reject his child to be able to feed his addiction. All right, so that was my first daddy wound, and then um, um, so on. These are the things we have to go to the Lord about and start documenting and writing down, okay? So we can go back to those broken bridges and God can heal them for us, okay? All right, moving on. Once you get through that first list that I talked to you guys with earlier in the class, um, then we can move on to rejection. Okay, I am going to skip a lot of this because y'all should be reading it anyways, all right? So um, when you read it, I think that we pretty much lay it out for what it is in the book. Um, 
and if you have questions, you can come to us about it. But basically, rejection is the opposite of love. It's the refusal to receive love or to give love it is the opposite of love. So basically, if you're not sure if you were rejected by somebody, you compare it to where you, did you feel loved by that person? So if the answer is no, I did not feel loved, then you felt rejected. Polar opposites, okay? All right. Um, rejection wounds are like layers of onions, okay? I'm a gardener, I love to garden. So they're like, they're like onions. You know when you, you take like the, the, when you have an onion, you have like that hard outer shell? And the, the couple times they're like, if it's a big onion, it's like a couple layers of that hard outer shell. And then you have like a, a slimy little layer that you gotta peel off. And then you get to the actual onion, right? And then you, you gotta take out that outer part of the onion. It's kind of like a flimsy yuck. I just throw that out, yeah. And then, and then you cut it in half right the, the onion and you have layers of that onion and when you take a piece of the layer out and if you actually hold it up to the light you'll see there's like little veins and there's actually you could see the cells inside of it okay and there's like layers micro layers inside each layer of onion this is how our wounds are our wounds in our souls mind Will and emotion is our soul. The wounds in our souls are like onions. And the defensive mechanisms that we have built from our broken bridges in our life are that outer hard shell around the onion, protecting that wound. That's what defense mechanisms do. They protect the, the pain and the hurt and the wound, okay? So somebody says something to you and you're like, hey, and you get offended. That's that hard defense mechanism, okay? Another defense mechanism besides codependency is isolation. Stuffing it as if it didn't happen, as if you're not hurt, as if nobody's ever rejected you, as if you don't have pain, as you're just Miss Perfect, okay? And, and not facing the reality of what you've done to hurt others and what others have done to hurt you. It's called being real in this class. That's a defensive mechanism, it's called denial. Denial is a defensive mechanism. That's that hard outer shell of the onion, okay? That's on the DMI left column, okay? That DMI left column is all defense mechanisms. Anger, rage, addiction, abuse, all of that are defense mechanisms. That's the outer shell. So once we face our DMI and our defense mechanisms, that outer shell, we can what? Peel those layers off, right? And we get to the core. Here's the great thing about this class in inner healing and what we do here. You don't have to go through the layers. You can take that butcher's knife, the Holy Spirit, goes right through that onion, boom, opens it up, to the core of the wound that caused the pain and all those defense mechanisms and attachments to the enemy. And we deal with that core wound and we face it, we face the pain, we face the person who caused the pain, we forgive it, we forgive them, we walk through forgiveness, we break ties to it, that's coming up, and then we grieve the loss of that broken bridge and that relationship. This is the process of inner healing. And so you don't have to just keep going around the mountain trying to figure out a way of how to stop being angry, how to, how to stop reacting in anger, how to stop being miscontrolling, how to stop you know, isolating, how to stop being in self-pity, how to stop being in denial, how to, how to stop being in, in toxic, dysfunctional relationships. How come my kids this? How come this? How come this? How come everyone's against me? How come I'm a victim? How come this? All of this. This is how you stop it, is this process. Okay? All right. Two things, two types. Moving on, page 39. Two types of rejection. Fear of rejection. Self-rejection. Okay? Fear of rejection and self-rejection. Fear of rejection is things that we do 
to prevent being rejected because you're living your life not knowing this, you're not knowing this, you're living your life with these mechanisms that you do based out of the fear that they're going to reject you. Somebody's going to reject you. So I'll get to that in a minute, okay? Um, that's why we put up walls, defense mechanisms. We put them up because we're self-protecting, self-protection, all right? So that, nope, not going to hurt me, okay? That's fear of rejection, all right? Uh, fear of rejection um, is also bitterness, which we'll learn about next week, and resentments, okay? Um, fear of rejection is stuffing the pain, trying to act like it never happened, isolating yourself from all the people that love you, from the body of Christ, from Jesus himself, trying to act like as if he ain't already there. Okay? We do these things out of the fear of being rejected by other people. And self-rejection is addiction. Self-rejection is I feel bad about myself. I'm a victim, so I deserve to be abused. I deserve to be in an abusive relationship because I'm damaged goods. Okay? Even though you're not saying those things out in the, in, into the atmosphere, you're believing those lies from the enemy from childhood and therefore living it out. Okay? So therefore, we self-reject ourselves and we punish ourselves willingly or unwillingly, consciously, consciously or not, we are punishing ourselves by either being in abusive relationships, by doing drugs and alcohol by whatever, okay? They're all punishing ourselves. And of course, the ultimate self-rejection is suicide. Nobody cares. It's it really the ultimate self-pity is suicide. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. The world is crashing down, so I might as well just kill myself and get it over with. It is the ultimate self-pity. That is... Self, you take self, I call it self-pity city. Self-pity city, and you take it to another level, that's suicide. Okay? Self-rejection. All right? Um, those are the two types. The reason why um, we do them are all the reasons why we just listed for our broken bridges. Because we've been rejected in childhood. We've been rejected in our teenage years. We've been, re it's been a continuous like life of rejection. And so because you've had so much rejection from so many people, you get to a point as an adult where you're like, screw it. I'm not going to be in a relationship ever again. Right, Romeo? Yeah. Who never was in a relationship for 17 years because he was like, well, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done having a family. I'm done. I'm done being a part of a family. I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to be in a relationship with no woman because all they do is hurt me. So I'm just going to play video games, do drugs, and just isolate. Just be myself. Me, myself, and I. That's all I need. That's Romeo's testimony. Yeah. He was like, screw everyone. I don't, I don't want to do with anybody. Yeah. Yep, that was him. Me, on the other hand, I'm the extrovert. So I was, the, I was on the other side. I was the social butterfly. So I continuously ran to men who would continuously abuse me and treat me like crap and then had a reason to self-reject myself and be, and be using drugs because it gave me a reason to self-reject myself. Yeah. So I was the opposite. I was running from, you know, relationship, dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. And then got to the point where I was finally like, oh, okay, well, I don't, need, I don't need a man except for, you know, I'll just, I'll just live my own life. And, and, and unless, you know, I, I want them for one thing and one thing only, that's the only reason why I need a man. I got to that point where I would just use and abuse them. That's called projection. 
And that's out of fear of rejection. So I started abusing them and treating them like crap and criticizing them and being super controlling over them and putting them down all the time, verbally and emotionally abusing them because out of fear of rejection. I'm gonna abuse you before you can abuse me. Okay? All right. Page 41, we give you an example we give you an example of, um, why can't I? Um, turn it off, okay. Um, give an example of lists. It's not working, that's why I hate electronics. Yeah, I need it erased. It's not erasing. I'll just do it with my hand. It's not, the pen's not working. Maybe the pen's not charged. Okay. Now it is. That's why, that's why I don't like electronics. But anyways. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we give you an example of rejection lists that you're going to start writing. You're going to take a sheet of paper out. You're going to write dad at the top. And you're going to write it hurt me when... Blah, 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 blah. Whatever dad did when you left me and did this. When you drank and you did this. When you, whatever, abused me. Whatever it is. Whenever, whatever it is. If maybe you were, maybe you were the sibling that was always forgotten. Maybe you, you weren't the prized child. And, and you were the rug wrap. That's rejection. You weren't their favorite, and because you weren't their favorite child, you felt rejected. Dad and mom, it hurt me when you thought that my sister or brother was the best and I was nothing. Okay? That's rejection. So we want you to write these lists up. The next list, you, after you get done with those, the next list you're going to do is you're going to put God at the top. And you're going to put God at the top. So it's going to look like this. Uh, yeah, it, it's the pen. It's not working. Oh, I see why. Okay. Came apart. Uh, so dad, it hurt me when you chose to drink and not love me. Hurt me when you criticized me. Okay? I'm just going to keep, keep writing these lists. Okay? All right. Um, after you get done with mom, dad, sisters, brothers, step parents, exes, people who abused you, then you're going to do God. It hurt me when you didn't stop so-and-so from hitting me, abusing me, blah, blah. Because we do blame God, don't we? We blame God for the rejection wounds in our life. So when... You know, I was in my first, my first domestic violence relationship. I was 16. And um, it started from rape. I was uh, raped five times in my life in different ages, starting from the age of 13. Um, and then the second one was 16. And so he was the 16. And um, it was very tumultuous relationship. And um, it, I was at a party drinking doing drugs, and we were staying over the night, and I was driving my, my friends, and we were there, and I, I decided to crash for two hours. It was snowing outside. Yeah, I was up north. And uh, before I got on the roads, the icy roads, and um, I crashed, and when I woke up, we were having sex. That's rape. Unwanted sex is rape, okay? 
So, um, so uh, I ended up dating him because everybody knew we had sex at the party. So we ended up dating, even though I didn't want to be with him, and um, ended up, uh, because I'm a social butterfly, um, I would always, you know, hang out with the guys, and, you know, I was like one of the, the guy girls. I don't know if you know what that means, but I was, I was always the girl that was around all the guys, all right? Not that I didn't have girlfriends, but I just liked hanging out with the guys better. So um, they were cooler and funner. So um, I was always one of, the, one of the guys, one of the guy girls. Anyways, I'm hanging out. We're drinking. We're, you know, smoking, doing drugs at a party, and I was always the only girl there and um he just comes up to me first time i was ever punched in the face by a man and he just comes up to me like out of nowhere and he just like i don't know i'm talking to one of his best friends and i'm talking and we're joking and we're laughing and we're having a great time you know and it was like boom like that like literally out of nowhere full fist punch right to the cheekbone and jaw like right there didn't knock me out though so i'm a little proud of that at least so then, then i then when, he, when i went down i like he knocked me down though and i got down and i i was just like in total shock like i could not believe that he just did this and so obvious broken bridge of trust and with men with him particularly but with men in general in relationships so i get up my defense mechanism kicks in and i get up and we start fighting we start going at it because i'm a fighter you ain't you know you're not this is this is not gonna happen right so we start fighting the guys break us up and i'm like screw you i get in the car i take off I'm totally like tripping off of acid right now, drinking, been smoking pot for probably a whole day and night by this time. You know, I mean, I was like totally lit and I'm driving in the snow, right? Because I'm so raging right now. And he chases me down and he runs me off the road and I go in a ditch and then we start fighting right there in the street and then the cops pull us over and they're like, what's going on you kids? Just break it up, go home. This was my life, every day. Okay, 16, 17, he was two years older, 17. Then he got in trouble. My parents filed a, a, a restraining order, but that didn't help. So, <clears throat> didn't really do anything. So uh, he gets in trouble with the law and uh, I was relieved, <laughs> so, thank you Jesus. You can get out of my life now. Uh, and then uh, he goes somewhere, I can't say, and he goes somewhere and then ends up manipulating that situation and then gets kicked out of that situation, comes back. I'm like, oh, God, I thought I was rid of him. So, um, yeah. So then uh, my mom and dad, then my, my drug addiction goes from, like, what I used to call the good drugs, the fun drugs, like LSD, mushrooms, you know, fun drugs, tripping on every day, uh, to uh, crack cocaine. Because now I'm like totally just wanting to be numb. Because I couldn't get out of the abusive relationship because of the situation I can't talk about. And I couldn't get out of it. I didn't have the protection that I needed. My parents tried everything. I was stuck in this relationship. Okay? And I didn't know how to get out. So what did I do? I ran, just like every addict does. So I ran to the streets of Gary in the hood and I started using crack because I'm like, I know one place he ain't gonna go. So, so I knew where he would not go and he didn't go there, but I did, yeah. So then I was full blown crackhead at that point, just trying to escape the hell that I was in, yeah. But the good news is, is that the Lord knew that was gonna bring me to the Lord. Because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been strung out on crack for three weeks, roaming the streets of Gary, God knows where I was. And that's when I finally turned to the Lord, was in that moment when I was 18. It wasn't the therapy, it wasn't the, you know, all the counselors, it wasn't none of that. It was the Holy Spirit inside of me because I did go to church, I was raised in a church. The Holy Spirit inside of me, crying out, as Romans says, to when, when I couldn't do it myself, to Abba, okay? And he did rescue me in that moment, 
and that was the beginning of my recovery from drugs. But technically, um, I stopped using crack pretty quickly after that, actually. But that was one story of rejection in my life. There were many. Um, but this is why we have to face it, okay? Rejection is like, um, quickly, rejection is like a tree, okay? And I am not an artist, okay? But this is the best thing you're going to get, all right? And um, we, we have little apples, right? And they fall down from this fruit tree, right? And we have some still on the tree. Now, the tree is not meant to be rejected, all right? The tree is something that's, that's our bridge, that's our trust, okay? So the Holy Spirit says in Galatians 5, 22, 23, I don't even think it's in your book, I'm not, I don't know, but the Holy Spirit is, is, the fruits of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, long-suffering, all right? These are fruits of the Holy Spirit. But the fruits of rejection, when you're constantly being rejected, having all these like scars, then what happens? These beautiful green limbs, they start dying. They start dying. The fruit dies. Right? And then you just have rotten fruit here on your soil. And you just have this bare tree. This broken, dead tree. You ever see those on the side of the road? Like those dead trees are just hollow on the inside? Yeah. That's what we're like in our souls from rejection. No matter how much makeup we put on, no matter how much we go to the gym, no matter how much plastic surgery we get, no matter what we do to our bodies, this meat bag that is over our souls, if we do not face the rejection wounds of our life, all we are is just hollow, empty, dead trees. Even, even as Christians. But the good news is we don't have to live that way. Okay? Yes, maybe you gave your life to Christ. Great job. That's the first step. Okay, maybe you come to church all the way. Great, you're getting filled up once a week. Maybe you read the Bible, even better. Fantastic. Maybe you've, you've, you've made the next step in saying, okay, maybe I'm not perfect, and maybe I do have some wounds or something's wrong in my life and I need to face it, okay? So maybe you've taken that first step, okay? And maybe you got now what's called a wellspring of life, okay? So now you have some... Some kind of, you know, like a tree that's like, if you cut the branches, okay, as a gardener, when you prune, that's why the Bible says God prunes us. When you prune like a dying bush or a tree and you prune it and you cut it back, it strengthens the root system and it strengthens the, 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 the root of the tree, like the log, like the, the beginning log that comes out of the ground. So here's the ground. This was eventually rotten with rotten fruit, by the way. And we have roots, right, from our tree. Well, when our tree is, we have dad, mom, um, you know, first abuser, we'll say, first rape, second rape, domestic violence, you know, molestation, um, drug abuse, and so on. Okay? So if, if these are your roots to your tree, we're the tree. You cannot ignore this. Just because you get saved and you go to church, you still gotta, you still gotta face each one of these things. Because you know why? The fruit that's coming down, you might be like, oh, yeah, I'm doing great, I'm doing great. But that fruit is dead. That's coming down. All the fruit, it's called fruits of rejection, is coming down. It's anger, 
self-pity, self-righteousness, all those things on the left-hand column of the DMI, that's fruits of rejection, defensive mechanisms. If you're just defensive mechanism all day, that is not the Holy Spirit, that is not of the Lord, that is not positive fruit, okay? It's, it's not the enemy's fault, it's all of the years of rejection. That is the problem. And without facing these problems, we're never going to change the fruit that comes out of our lives, ever. No matter how many times you get saved, I say that to some people because there's some people that believe you can lose your salvation, no matter, which is not the truth, no matter how many times that you can, you go to a revival and you get laid hands on by some and you get knocked out by the Holy Spirit. No matter how many times you get healings, no, ma no matter how many times you get delivered, okay, you still got to face your rejection roots. Without facing your rejection roots, you ain't ever gonna produce good change in your life, ever. And you're never going to be able to receive the anointing that God has for you, and you're never gonna be able to fulfill the call on your life that God has created for you, for his kingdom, for his purpose and glory, ever. Because you're stuck in a rut of rejection. No matter what you do, no matter how many times you go to church, the only way to get free is to face it. We have to face the pain to get free. Amen? Good news is we can get free. That's the good news. But it's going to take work. It's going to take time. But we can tell you and attest in our own lives that it, that it works. I, close out, I... Um, could never understand why in my life as a Christian after quitting, you know, crack cocaine and, and, and I just went from one addiction to another. Then I went to, you know, alcohol and I was a total alcoholic. And then I, you know, went, because, you know, alcohol was fun. I really loved to drink. Okay, I ain't gonna lie. I love to drink. I love getting on tables at bars. I love taking control over the whole atmosphere. I loved the attention that alcohol gave me. Okay, all right, I loved it. I loved everything about the bar scene, okay? Everything, the club scene, you name it. All right, so um, that was an adult. That was me as a Christian. Reading my Bible, but working hard all week and then believing the lie that I deserve it. I deserve to go out with the girls Friday night and go have fun because I worked my butt off all week. So I deserve it to let loose and cut loose on the dance floor. It's only a few drinks. Well, that is the biggest lie. Any drinker knows that. You start with like two drinks and before you know it, it's 4 a.m. and you're closing the bar and you've already drank a fifth of Bacardi. Okay, let's be honest. It's not just one or two drinks. It'll start maybe one day with one or two drinks and then another day with two or three and then another day with three or four. There's always a compromise. You're constantly compromising. Any addict knows it. Okay, anyways, moving on. That was me. And I always thought to myself, well, I quit drinking, Lord. Oh, well, you know this, I'm trying this. I'm doing my best here. I read my Bible. I'm going to church. I'm serving you, Lord. I'm doing all these things. And it was like I was making these lists. Still couldn't get breakthrough. Still couldn't get breakthrough in my life, right? So one thing I'm going to share is um, recently, this is why I journal all the time, okay? This is why journaling, when you get through this class and you walk through your um, defense mechanisms and you break a bunch of stuff off and you walk through forgiveness with all these people, and yourself and God, okay? It's, it's a journey, that's why we call it a journey of healing. Once you get to that place and you've walked through your entire past, okay, of rejection wounds and resentments, and you get to that place, you get to a place where you're like, well, I don't need to journal anymore. Well, you know what, I want to journal, you know why? Because the Lord has not rejected me. I rejected the Lord. 
I rejected Jesus on the cross. When, when I want to smoke, I reject Jesus. When I want to drink, I reject Jesus. When I want to sit in self-pity at my home and feel sorry for myself and declare myself as a victim, I'm rejecting Jesus. Okay? When we are not walking in who he created us to be, we are rejecting Jesus. Okay? Because we're not loving him. All right? Any, remember, the opposite of love is rejection. So if we're not loving God, then we're rejecting God. Okay? Anyways, so this is why I love to just listen to him. All right? So he revealed to me that um, uh, my dad, another rejection wound was, uh, my dad was very critical, like he had a critical spirit. He didn't know this, of course. But um, we were a musical family, okay? Um, so I was raised up, and my dad played trombone and piano. He's like, he played everything, you know. And he sang tenor, he had a beautiful tenor voice. And, um, and my mom sings uh, alto and soprano and plays piano too, but she only plays by like reading music, and my dad plays everything by ear. So um, he was like a bar pianist guy, you know. So um, anyways, um, so I, when I started playing piano, when I was a little girl, um, dad would naturally, you know, be drinking in the kitchen and the piano's in the living room and he'd come around and, and, and he'd be like, oh, okay. And he'd stand over me as I'm sitting at the piano and he'd stand behind me and over me and he'd be like, okay, oh no, you gotta hit that note. Okay, no, no, okay, all right, nope, stop, all right, you gotta, you gotta do it. He was always correcting me, right? But I received this as a little girl as criticism, you know, because I'm learning, right? And I felt like the pressure, right, to be perfect, to please dad. So finally, I worked and worked and worked. We had this old uh, classical, oh my gosh, this thing was like falling apart then. And it was this old, like, uh, it's a classical, um, we'll call it a music book, okay? And it was like, I'm talking timeless classical pieces, and I'm talking original scores. So I remember I, 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 I uh, was taking piano lessons, but it bored me to death, so I, I, did, I hated that. So then I, I just took this book out, and I opened it up at the piano, and I, I to like this one piece that my dad loved, and I just, I, I did every note on the piano, and I figured out the chords, and I did chord by chord, right? And I worked so hard. I was like, eight and I was so hard on this on this piece and and I finally got it and I, I was able to play it and I was so proud of myself and I go and I play it and my dad comes home from work from the bar I should say and I play it and I was like yes you know I'm gonna make dad happy and um I'm playing it and he comes in and mom and dad are singing it you know they're singing it because I'm playing it at you know I'm actually able to play the song now so they're singing it and I'm like yay you know I'm feeling good about myself look at my happy family they're singing in harmony together and everything and he we get done with the song and he's like he's like okay good but now you got to do it at this tempo and now I want you to work on the crescendos and the decrescendos and make sure you know you go a little softer here and make sure you really have the dynamics here and all this stuff right and I'm just sitting there like still not good enough I'm still not good enough I did all I'm eight and I was playing a piece that adults play and it still wasn't good enough so that's what I received. Even though I know that he was doing it for my best to make me better and for me to be at my best, okay, I knew that he was doing it for my good. I felt rejected and not good enough. So I believed the lie that I had to be perfect. I had to look perfect. I had to sing perfect. I had to play perfect. I had to be perfect all the time. Otherwise, if I wasn't, then I would never receive love from my parents or deserve love from anybody, especially myself. See, because of rejection, I believed those lies and then lived my entire life that way. Because of rejection, I was afraid to make a mistake on stage when I performed as a little girl, even though I was performing, I was, I was top, you know, pianist of the state in my state in Indiana. 
and, and I was afraid to make a mistake. And I remember I got second place in all state. I was 16 and I got second place. And the judge came up to me, the woman. I got first place in every competition I entered all the time, vocally, everything. I'm not saying that to be prideful or like to, to boast. I'm just trying to explain the situation. So, so I would, they had like sight reading competitions. They had for, for vocals and, 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 and piano. And I, and I won first place. And we had like group competitions and you know, the group won first place. We had you know, all these things, right? So we get to the, the piano competition. And I, you know, I had great prospects. I mean, I, had, I could have gone for music, obviously. And the lady, the judge comes up to me and she goes, I marked you second because I was your sight reading teacher. I was the woman who um, did your sight reading for your piano. And she said, and based on how well you did in the sight reading for that piece, I thought to myself, oh my God, I can't wait to hear her play her, her, right, her composition piece. And she's like, and when I heard your composition piece, even though you did a great job, I think you can do better. So I'm still not good enough. <laughs> so what did I do? Juilliard came my way, and I went running because I could not take the rejection anymore. That fear of rejection, of, of not ever making the cut, of not ever being perfect enough, made me abuse myself with drugs and alcohol and be in terrible relationships wasn't just that one thing. It's one thing of many things. Remember, it's all onions, all layers. Okay, but that's one onion. Yeah. So you could see why after I got clean and sober, when the Lord called me to, to lead worship, I was so nervous because I was like, oh my God, what if I make a mistake? And people are like, it's okay, girl, if you make a mistake. I'm like, no, it's not okay. People are gonna make fun of me. People are gonna know that I'm making a mistake. Like, be, the, I still had that. Yeah, and the enemy was still using that. It really wasn't until inner healing, even though I had the performancism in me and the training in me to be able to sing through it, the, the fear, and to sing through everything, the attacks, and to play through it. Even though I got through it and I did it performance-wise, I wasn't free. And I couldn't get free until I finally faced what rejection wounds were in me that were causing me to be bound up and why I couldn't finally get that breakthrough. And that's why I can tell you from experience, it wasn't until I got free from facing all of my rejection wounds and walking through inner healing process and walking through my journey to healing that I was finally able to get breakthrough in that area in my life in many, every area in my life. Amen? Amen? All right, so make sure you face it this week. Write the list and don't be afraid to face it because the fruit that's coming is far greater than the dead fruit that is coming off your trees right now. Amen? Amen. All right, amen. Thank you all.